If you notice, my, uh, my voice is recovering right now. Um, I, we were just getting back yesterday from the March for Life. Uh, it was an absolutely amazing week. Uh, a few of our young people who had came with us uh, on it, uh, Kenny's still wiping the eye boogers out of his eyes, uh, it looks like, from, a, from just a long, good week uh, together on the March for Life. Half a million people walking one direction uh, on Capitol Hill protesting against abortion, standing up for life. Um, everybody there not doing it for themselves, but all of us doing it for marching on behalf of someone else who doesn't have a voice. It was a really, really amazing, amazing experience. Um, this is my eighth time in nine years going. It, it's, it's been an awesome, awesome experience every time. One of the things I notice uh, when we go, and uh, some of the people had said in past trips, it feels almost like the church marching together. You got everybody, from people in strollers to people in walkers, right? We got everybody from men and women. We got every kind of color of person that possibly exists. Um, different religions moving all one way. And it's really, really beautiful to see unity in that way. Um, it really does look a little bit like what I hope and pray that we look like walking into heaven, right? A little slice of it here in our country. Whenever I think about it, I, I can't help but think about the March for Life, the witness of these young people, the witness of all the people, the witness of the 15 of us from our parish, the, the 160 of us from our diocese. It's a, it's a bright example. It's a bright witness to us all, right? There's some light that shines in the darkness of our culture, in the darkness of our world. Um, whenever on Wednesday we heard that the president would be coming to speak at the rally beforehand, not going to lie, I was a little bit worried. Um, being, a, being in charge of uh, 160 people and being responsible for the trip and, and all these things, knowing that the primary thing with us was safety, I, I was kind of worried because if you hadn't noticed, if you want to watch the news, our world right now is very, very splintered. There's a lot of division. And the last thing I wanted is to us to get caught in the middle of some kind of argument, some kind of stupidity, and somebody get hurt. So I, my anxiety whew, was high on in. But during the course of the walk, during the course of the trip, really wasn't a big deal. Because there's something about the good that we were standing up for that unified us, and that was a witness. Whether the media covers it or not, that's not important. The witness that we share, the light that is shared in this experience, is something that changes us as pilgrims on the journey. But I think it's also something that changes the culture around us. One of the things that I've noticed um, in the world around us that we, that, that we can take spiritual examples, like right, spiritual lessons from the physical world. If you were ever to walk into a dark room, pitch black, can't see anything, right? Can't see your hands. You, all it is is you feel like your eyes, like you, you can feel stuff, but you can't see anything. It's, it's kind of a disheartening, kind of scary moment. But if somebody put the smallest candle, the smallest flame in that room, the entire room changes. Right? The entire room changes. Because darkness is not a thing. Darkness is an absence of a thing. Right? Darkness doesn't actually exist. Darkness is the absence of light. Our world, we like to use the phrase, we have a dark world. Right? There's a darkness in the world around us. Well, darkness is an absence of light. In our world, the thing is, that there, there's a lot of evil because it belongs to the devil. Right? Our world, there's a lot of evil, and evil is not a thing. Evil is the absence of a thing. Just like darkness. When it comes to darkness, all the darkness in the world, all of the darkness in the world, all of the dark, all the physical darkness in the world cannot overcome the spark of the smallest candle. Darkness is afraid of light. Darkness runs away from light. In our gospel today, we hear about 
we hear in our gospel, in our responsorial psalm, and in our first reading about this concept of a light will come from you, Zebulun and Nephtali. Zebulun and Nephtali, for you to, just so we all on the same page, was two Jewish areas, two Jewish places where a very, very embarrassing battle was lost. And they were kind of seen as just having this stigma of like, they, that was kind of became the history for them. They became known as this place where horrible things happened to the Jewish people. And it was just kind of an embarrassment. It was one of those places that you kind of point to and laugh at. And Isaiah, the prophet, says that Zebulun and Naphtali, from you, where Capernaum is, right in that area, from you will come a great light. And we hear about it in our gospel today, that Jesus settles in this area. And that's where he lives. That's where, his, that's where he makes his home. He's from Nazareth. He dies in Jerusalem. But his life, he lives in Capernaum. From you, Zebulun and Naphtali, there will be a great light. In the Jewish context even, there's a light that's coming out of the darkness. See, in our world, the history of our world, there's been a lot of dark periods. There's been a lot of dark moments, I would say. In our, in our, in our world's history, and you, you look back at some of the stuff that was happening in the Romans, like way back when... 1,800, 2,000 years ago, the persecution of Christians that was going on right after the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem and all these things, the enslavement of people throughout the history, even to our own country, the slave trade that went on that much of the world around us was kind of built upon. There's a darkness that's behind all this. Because the world belongs to the devil. We, we don't have to go that far back, though. We can go something that might have happened in some of our lifetime, but that no doubt we've heard about. About 90 years ago, in Germany, one man rises to power. While we were in Washington, as part of this group, as part of our, as part of our pilgrimage, we went to the Holocaust Museum. And in talking in the Holocaust Museum... There was a, like when walking around the Holocaust Museum, we were able to kind of see and experience a lot of these things that went on 90 years ago in the first world country of Germany and all around Europe. That one man's quest for power and one man's racist or, or, or creedist kind of thing where he kind of was setting up and division and casting out other people was leading to a genocide. Now, I've had the opportunity in... in, in Years ago, to be able to, to actually go to Poland and to visit Auschwitz. Tomorrow, by the way, is the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz concentration camp. And in Auschwitz, this building, these buildings, this place was built and designed to be a factory of death. People would come in on a rail car, they would go through a certain process, they would go through certain lines, and they would be killed. And if they weren't killed, they were put to work. It was a factory of death, an assembly line of death. Walking around that place, I have never experienced more of a darkness in its history. Like, like a darkness that's just connected to a place. I would have to imagine that for a Jewish person, Naphtali and Zebulun are similar. That when they walked into this place, they could feel the history of darkness. But the thing is, is that if we, if we believe the scriptures today, if we believe the world around us, that we can draw spiritual experiences and spiritual lessons from the physical world, then we know that no matter the history of darkness, that light can overcome it. Amen? We believe that no matter what the history of darkness that a place has, that light can overcome it. Even in Auschwitz. One day there was a, uh, a prisoner that got out of Auschwitz. That got out of this, this concentration camp. And he wasn't there the next day for the lineups. They didn't catch him. He was, he was gone. So the guards in Auschwitz decided what they were going to do is, in response of this one person getting out, that they were going to pull ten other people up. 
As retribution, as a way of causing fear to the rest of the camp that you do not leave, for every one that leaves, ten will die. They go through the roll call. And they get ten people. The tenth person, his name and number gets called, he comes up and he's, he's bawling. He's pleading with the guards, please, no, 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 I'm married, I have children, please, I want to see my kids again. Standing in line, as he did many times before, there was a Catholic priest. His name was Maximilian Kolbe. Uh, he was a Franciscan in Poland, and he was in charge of a newspaper that was writing out and speaking out boldly and proudly against the Nazi propaganda. Moved with compassion for this man, in a, in a miraculous moment, he steps out of line, which usually would have been enough of a reason to be shot. He steps out of line, he walks up to the guard, he looks at him and he says, I'm a Catholic priest, take me and not him. Normally, the Nazis would have just looked at him and said, we're going to take 11, not 10. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit inspired whatever it is, some reason, the man gets back in line and Colby takes his place. The man's family was at Maximilian Colby's canonization. Maximilian Colby was the light for the moment that even the guards couldn't ignore. Even the one committing the evil could not ignore. He went into the starvation bunker. He outlived all the prisoners. What he would do is he would hear confessions. He would roll there. He, he would he would roll his beads, his rosary beads, till they finally got tired of him singing Mary and hymns because he just wouldn't die. He did a lethal injection. See, Maximilian Colby was a light in the greatest darkness, one of the greatest dark moments, dark places in human history. Maximilian Colby is, is a light shining in that darkness, reflecting the light of Christ, the light of the world that we hear about today in the gospel, the same light of the world, the light of Christ that we receive at our baptism in a candle. Maximilian Kolbe was a, was a bold witness to the Lord. Now, Father, that's great. That's a, that's, that's a wonderful story. That's really powerful that he could stand up in that kind of evil. But, like, what, what about me? We don't, we don't have a concentration camp in, in Thibodeau. We're we, we, we not, we not in this situation, Father. Like, what, what about me? First of all, in our country, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely proud of the 15, 16 people that came from our parish to be a light in a dark world. To be a light in the division that is our world today. But even more so for us, now, here, at home, are we willing to be the light in a dark world? Are we willing to stand up for truth and for goodness and for beauty and for the one faith that we all profess? Are we willing to share it and to stand up for it in our world? And that sounds like, okay, it might be kind of abstract. Let me put, make it concrete for you. Are you willing to evangelize your family? To share your faith with your family? Especially that aunt, that uncle that I like to talk about, right? Are you willing to, to, to call out hypocrisy, bigotry, and uncharity, gossip in your workplace? Or, that's them. I'm just going gonna, gonna to just be passive with it. Are you willing to reach out to the kid who has no friends at your school? And to even endure being their friend. See, this is what it means to be a light in darkness. 
That we can be an actor or a bystander when it comes to spreading this light. One of the most amazing facts that I heard that I hadn't heard before and never put into context when we were going to the Holocaust Museum, the girl that was kind of welcoming us and sharing with us a couple of things about the museum asked the question. She looked at us and she said, 11 million people died in the Holocaust. How many people did Hitler kill? None. At the end of the whole thing, he killed himself. Whenever, the, whenever he was about to be arrested for fear of what might happen to him. But he, was, he did not kill another person during the entirety of the Holocaust or World War II. People that were okay to be in bystanders did his work for him. We're called, just like Christ was the light that came from Capernaum and that shared that light with the world around us and continues to share that light with us through the sacraments, through baptism that we're going to celebrate after Mass, through the Eucharist that we receive here, through the sacrament of reconciliation. Like We continue to taste and to experience the light that was Jesus. And we're called to, sh- to receive that light, to embrace that light, and to go out and share that light. Are we willing to do it? We know that the light beats the darkness. Are we willing to share it? Today as we come to Mass, as we come to receive communion, as we come to be strengthened in our witness, May we follow the example of somebody like a Maximilian Colby or a Mother Teresa or John Paul II or Sister Faustina, all of which experienced this, these horrors during their lifetime. May we be the next generation of saints willing to go out to share the light in the darkest corners of our world. May we go out with confidence, with hope, knowing that God will overcome, that God will win. We can all march in one direction. Same way that we did in the March for Life two days ago. As a community of faith, sharing and spreading the gospel, spreading the light in a dark world.